All right, it is seven o'clock. Welcome everyone. My name is Anastina Wardlaw and I'm a crisis clinician with Mass Support and the host for today's evening. It is both a privilege and a pleasure to welcome you here tonight. And I wanna start the evening by thanking you for being here. I know that we all have choices about how we're gonna spend our evenings and it's just an honor, an honor that you've chosen to be with us tonight. We have close to 800 people registered for this event tonight. And honestly, when I saw that number, it was rising throughout the week. My nerves were getting a little higher and I just thought, well, thank God this is a webinar and you're, you're all not in front of me. That's a lot of people. And then as the day went on today, I was really humbled by it as well because we have worked so hard in this event and when we threw it together, you know, sort of the culmination of all of our thoughts as a team and which I'll get into in a minute. But it also made me a little sad that we threw this together and here um, close to 800 people signed up. So it sort of, I have sort of mixed feelings about such a large number. But with that said, thank you. Thank you wherever you are in your kitchens and your living room sitting with us. We really appreciate you being here. This virtual town hall is a brand new experience for us, as I'm sure it is for you. Um, and so with that said, I'm gonna walk you through the evening, um, what it's gonna look like, how to do the Q&A, introduce you to our panelists, things of that nature. I'll tell you a little bit about mass support and how this town hall came into being. Um, so before we get into that, I wanna tell you a little story this morning we were running through, it was actually more this afternoon, we were running through um, what this town hall was going to be like. And so I went through some notes with somebody and I was reading my notes and I had asked for feedback from a colleague and the colleague, and she was very quiet. And I said, you know, please give me feedback. This is why we're doing it. And she said, oh, Anastina, it sounds really great, but it sounds like you're a school principal giving a graduation speech. And I said, I was a school principal and that's all I knew how to do. So I promise you, I'm gonna try my best to make it not sound like a graduation speech. Um, and honestly, it's a little strange because I can't see any of you, but I can feel you all with me. So, but I do apologize ahead of time if this does sound like a speech. Um, so first of all, to tell you about Mass Network, we provide free community outreach and support services to residents of all ages, including children, all throughout Massachusetts. We are operating in response to COVID-19. The program is funded by Federal Emergency Management Administration, otherwise known as FEMA, and managed in partnership between the Massachusetts Department of Mental Health and Riverside Trauma Center, which is a program of Riverside Community Care. Mass Sport has six teams all throughout Massachusetts with both clinicians as well as counselors on every single team. Each team has approximately nine members and I myself am part of the Western Mass team. And the Western Mass team is the team that put this um, virtual town hall together for you. So a lot of us are working behind the scenes right now, looking at the Q&A. Um, we have people working um, to the left and the right and at their homes as well. Um, so let's see, each team is diverse in terms of professional experience, cultural backgrounds, and languages spoken, thereby allowing us to meet the challenging broad demands that COVID-19 has brought us. This is indeed an unprecedented time for all of us. As a former, as I said, elementary and middle school principal, I've been particularly worried about the psychological impact of COVID-19 crisis has had on children, parents, and school personnel. Specifically, how anxiety, fear, toxic stress, and COVID-19 has been impacting our bodies and minds. I'm thrilled that tonight we will hear from our guest speakers who will address not only these topics, but will also speak about resiliency, man managing transitions, coping skills, and self-care. So a little bit about this evening. We are starting at 7.05 um, and we'll go and right to a 7.30 with Dr. Christian Brathwaite. At 7.30, we'll go on to Dr. Robert Macy. And then at 7.50, we're gonna start our Q&A 
And then Sarah Gare, who is the head of the Western Mass, she is our lead. She will um, wrap up the evening for us. So let me um, tell you a little about the Q&A. All your questions will go into the Q&A. And because we have so many people with us tonight, um, we're gonna do our best to answer your questions, but know fully that we won't be able to answer all of them, but we're gonna save them and they will be used to help inform our future town halls. So please don't hesitate writing questions, anything that comes to mind, place it in there. And other information from us, we placed into the chat. Um, our websites, um, references, things of that nature will be placed into the chat. So without further ado, let me introduce Dr. Nicole Christian Brathwaite. She is a MD, a board certified child and adult psychiatrist. She completed psychiatry training at Mass General and McLean Hospitals. She is founder and CEO of Wells Mind Psychiatry and Consulting Company. She's nationally recognized expert on trauma, the impact of racism on mental health, developing trauma-informed schools and organizations, implicit bias, postpartum mental health, and mental health in communities of color. She serves and consultant in numerous organizations, universities, and school systems. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Ms. Christian, Dr. Christian Brathwaite. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anastina. Um, and welcome to everyone. Thank you for, for coming. I realize it's dinner time slash bedtime. And hopefully my four and my six-year-old won't come running in here to uh, see what they're missing, but I cannot make any promises. The door is closed, but who knows? And I, I'm sure a lot of parents who are working from home can completely relate to that. Um, so before we start, I, I'd like to go through a grounding exercise or a mindfulness exercise. And essentially mindfulness is just being present, being in the moment um, in an unjudgmental stance. And so, or non-judgmental stance, excuse me. And this exercise of mindfulness is um, a listening exercise. And I, this is something that we as parents can do. This is something that teachers can do. And we'll talk about this uh, throughout the evening about ways to build resilience and ways to decrease the stress response. And mindfulness is one of those ways that we can do it. So before we start, I just want to make sure that everyone is seated in a comfortable position. So with your feet flat on the floor, back against your chair. And while we're doing this exercise, I want to make sure that you're taking what we describe as diaphragmatic breaths. So that means that when you take a deep breath, if you were to put one hand on your chest and one hand on your, on your belly, when you breathe in, that hand on your belly is being pushed out more than the hand on your chest. So taking a deep breath in and really pushing your stomach out and breathing out and having your exhale be a few seconds longer than your inhale. Now, as we start to listen to this song, you can leave your eyes open or closed, but I would, I would ask that you listen, not just to the lyrics, but listen to the instruments. If you've heard this song before, are there things that you're noticing about it that you haven't heard before? Can you hear the drums? Can you hear the tambourine? Are there other instruments that you didn't recognize? And if you get distracted, that's totally fine. Just bring your attention right back to the song and we'll only do it for a few seconds. And again, this just kind of helps us to calm ourselves and bring ourselves into the moment. Can you please play? Thank you. And um, now that you've kind of gone through that exercise, if you need to stretch, stand up, move your body around, get loose, that's totally fine. So again, this is something that you can do with any song. I just happen to, to love Bob Marley, um, and I think the instrumental is great. But 
we'll talk about this um, when we're doing mindfulness, it's great to use all five senses and hearing is just one of the really useful ones. Next slide, please. Now, when we're, when we're thinking about stress and thinking about both for our kids and for ourselves, it's important to remember that stress is on a continuum. And there are primarily three types of stress. So there's positive stress, which for example would be like a first date or your first day at a new job, where you might have small increases in your heart rate, maybe brief increases in some of the stress hormones like cortisol or adrenaline, but overall it's not overwhelming and it's very tolerable. Then there's tolerable stress. Tolerable stress is more significant. This could be the loss of a pet, the loss of a loved one, um, a significant family disaster. But for the most part, the tolerable stress tends to be time limited. And often when we're thinking about our children, there's significant support around them. And their, their stress hormones are able to come back to baseline. Toxic stress. Toxic stress is what's incredibly problematic. Toxic stress occurs when there's strong, intense, unpredictable, and frequent stressors, often involving a loss of control. And it becomes even more toxic when children are experience this, experiencing the stress and they don't have the love and support of a safe adult around them. Examples of toxic stress could be living in a home with someone who is experiencing or dealing with substance use. And they, when they're under the influence, their personality may be very different. That may be very scary for a child. They, they don't know when they're going to walk into an unsafe situation. Another example of toxic stress is experiencing racism. Whether a child or an adult walking into a situation where they don't know when they're going to be discriminated against, they don't know when they'll experience bias or microaggression. So essentially what happens when you experience toxic stress, your body is always on edge because it never knows when that negative experience will come. So your stress hormones, your cortisol level, your adrenaline, those stay persistently elevated. And as we'll talk about, chronic stress produces chronic inflammation because of the persistence of the, the stress hormones being so high. Chronic inflammation can produce chronic illness, both mental and physical. Next slide, please. And this, this slide, I, I like to, to kind of go over with people what exactly is happening to our brain when we're under significant stress or when we experience trauma or toxic stress. And you don't have to do it with me, but you're more than welcome. So this is called the hand model of the brain. Dr. Dan Siegel was an, uh, is a child psychiatrist who created this model. So if you go to YouTube and search for him, you'll see his uh, videos of him describing this. So if you will, hold up your hand. Um, this, our hand is going to represent our brain. Our arm represents the brain stem, um, or the spinal cord, excuse me. Our wrist represents the brain stem. The inside of our hand represents what's called the limbic system. And then our fingers represent the top part of our brain. So if you were to fold your fingers over your thumb, this is your brain. So our fingers represent the front of our brain. Our, brain. our wrist represents our brain stem and our arm is our spinal cord going down. So essentially when we're overwhelmed, when we're incredibly stressed, what happens is our brain stem, which controls the part, of our, the part of our brain that just does things without us thinking. So it controls our heart rate, our breathing. Um, it's our fight, flight, or freeze. So this is the part of our brain that kicks in even when we aren't thinking about it. So if a lion were to run into your house right now, you wouldn't need to think. Your body is either going to go into fight, flight, or freeze automatically. Then the inside of our palm represents the emotional part of our brain. So this is like our amygdala, our hippocampus, the parts of our brain that help with memory. These are the parts of our brain that hold really, really big emotion. The top of our hand represents our cortex, the thinking part of our brain. And this is what helps with decision making. This is what helps with planning. And it's important to know that kids, their thinking part, that doesn't fully develop into their 20s. And so when we're normally at rest, when we're not overly stressed, think of it like you're, the thinking part of your brain, the upstairs brain, is giving a hug 
to the lower part of your brain. So when you experience something overwhelming or scary, you're able to kind of think about it in context because you're not overwhelmed, you can process it, and you're able to handle it. However, particularly with kids, when we think about they're probably you know, working with two fewer fingers because that thinking part of their brain is not fully developed, when they become overwhelmed, Dr. Siegel describes it as their lid gets flipped. So literally these four fingers, which is our thinking part of the brain, is no longer connected to the fight, flight, or freeze and our emotional brain. So now what's in control when we're overwhelmed or when we're stressed is our survival brain. So that means you're acting without thinking. You may, we may see this a lot with kids who kind of explode and that's because they're not able to process. And this even happens with adults. Our lids get flipped all the time. So I, I'm not originally from Massachusetts. I'm from Philadelphia. I've been here for about 11 years and there's so many wonderful things about Massachusetts. The one thing I'm struggling with is the driving. I still have not quite gotten used to Massachusetts drivers. And I recognize that my lid gets flipped every time I get in the car when I'm driving in Massachusetts. And so I always think about when I'm driving in Massachusetts and one of the incredible Massachusetts drivers cuts me off or they turn without using a, a turn signal, my lid gets flipped. So my thinking and processing brain is no longer connected. My emotional, my survival brain is connected. And if someone were to ask me, in that moment, right when someone cut me off to say, well, define depression for me, I would have a really hard time doing that because essentially what we know when our emotions are overwhelmed or when we're in, if afraid or stressed, it's hard to think clearly. So essentially experiencing really, really big emotions and thinking clearly is hard to do at the same time. Next slide, please. And so when we're thinking about our kids, who have experienced a significant amount of stress, we have to understand that both for parents and teachers, our children may look frequently like their lid is flipped. So they're working off of the survival brain. They're not working off of the rested in control brain. And so what does that look like? It looks like kids who are going to be in fight, flight, or freeze. They're in survival mode, even though it may not make sense to us, these children may feel unsafe for a variety of reasons, whether it's anxiety about or fear about COVID, about bringing COVID home, whether it's anxiety about being bullied or being discriminated against. There could be various different reasons that, uh, that send our children into kind of emotional overdrive. And what that looks like in the classroom, they, they may, these may be kids who can't sit still and they're running out of the classroom, they feel like they need to escape. They may be physically present, but emotionally completely checked out. These are the kids who teachers will say, they just exploded and I don't understand why. Like, I, I don't even know what, what triggered them. Um, these are, and these are often also the kids who have experienced trauma or toxic stress. These are the kids that don't always listen to what you say, but they're going to listen to what you do. So the change in the tone of your voice, the change in facial expression, your, your body language, they're looking at all of that in the same way when you're in a survival state, you're constantly looking at your environment and you're not necessarily able to focus on other things like learning. Um, and then there are the kids who freeze and just you, you ask them a question and they seem like they don't respond. Many of my patients and parents will tell me their kids are in that state, like they'll say, you know, ask them to do something and it just seems like there's a blank stare, that they're not there. And it's important to recognize that healthy brains are built, they're not born. So in order to help a child overcome toxic stress or trauma, we need to teach them skills to be able to do that. Because without that, their brain, again, the leg gets flipped and they go to this survival brain. Next slide, please. And when we're thinking about our older kids and frankly, even our younger kids as well, it's really important to recognize that they are grieving. And many of us are even grieving. And I mean, just if we think about what our children have lost, if we think about the, our juniors and seniors um, from of high school last year, they lost prom, they lost senior activities, they lost field trips. For those kids who were going off to school, they may not have had that last hurrah with their friends. They didn't get to have the celebratory experience or parties. And it's okay to grieve. It's okay for our kids to grieve these experiences because these are major losses for them. Some of us adults are even grieving. Maybe we lost a vacation. 
We're not able to see our parents or grandparents. We're not able to, to utilize things that normally help us to reduce stress, like going to dinner with friends. And so when we're thinking about grieving, some of the things that you may notice with your kids is that they're going through stages of grief. And it's important to recognize that grief is not a linear experience. You can go through different stages many different times. I've certainly been in denial one day. I'm like, this cannot be happening. It's going to be over tomorrow. Then I'm frustrated and angry. Like, how is this happening? And then I'm like, okay, well, if I just wear my mask this week, hopefully by next week, I won't have to deal with it. I'm bargaining. And then finally, I'm like, you know what? There's nothing I can do. Here we are. And then I watch the news and I'm like, ah, back to angry again. And so it's okay that we go into these cycles. And one of the important thing is that we acknowledge and listen to our children when they're grieving and not dismiss their pain. Because often adults tend to minimize the pain of children, not realizing that they need that opportunity for support. They need that opportunity to express what they're dealing with. There's a, a newer stage of grieving called uh, meaning. So it's how can we make meaning of this negative situation? How can we learn from it? How can we grow from it? And some kids are, you know, some people are making masks and helping other people. Some kids are supporting their younger siblings in school or tutoring other kids. There's many different ways that we can try to use this opportunity to build resilience and make meaning. Next slide, please. And when we're thinking about communicating with our kids and really listening and understanding them. This is, there's a great strategy that I always recommend. It's called reflective listening. Oftentimes as adults, we make the mistake of listening just to respond, but not necessarily listening to understand. And what I mean is that our child may be talking to us and we already have in our minds what we're going to say. So they may be asking us for something and we knew before we started that they were gonna, that they, we were gonna say no. We knew that this wasn't going to go anywhere. And so kids will often say, no one's listening to me. You don't understand me. You don't care about how I feel. And you know, sometimes it's true. Sometimes we have a million other things on our plate so we don't have time to listen. But one of the things that builds resilience and builds strength and reduces stress in kids is feeling like they're being heard, feeling like they can use their voice to, ha to have agency over their environment or impact their environment. And one of the ways we can help them with that is using reflective listening. So essentially, reflective listening is summarizing what you've heard, identifying the emotion that goes with it, because again, our kids don't have this top part fully developed where they can interpret what they're feeling or even articulate it, and then ask them to make sure that you got it right. So for example, if a kid wants to go out with friends and they, you're telling them they, they can't go out and they're having a tantrum, instead of just saying, you know, no, that's it, or instead of trying to correct them or fix something, you can simply say, wow, it sounds like that you really miss your friends. You want to spend time with them. And because of all the restrictions of COVID, you can't. And you're really angry about that. Is that, did I get that right? Does that sound like what you're experiencing? And if you're wrong, they'll tell you you're wrong. And it's okay for adults to be wrong and for us to model that and for us to fix it. Okay, well, I'm sorry, I, maybe I misunderstood. So, may, so maybe you're telling me that you're having this experience and you're really sad because you can't go out with your friends. And you'll see the reaction to this is pretty dramatic. I've even had kids say to me like, oh my gosh, you finally get me. Nobody else understands me. I haven't said anything significant. I simply summarized what you told me and tried to identify the emotion and to both help our kids build an emotional language, but also to help us understand what they're experiencing so that we're on the same page. Next slide, please. I also recommend this uh, reflective listening for adults. I think it's great for marriages, for friendships. And I, I love this, um, this cartoon. It says, I'm sorry, dear, I wasn't listening. Could you repeat what you've said since we've been married? So if you wanna practice it on your partners before you practice it on your kids, I'm sure it will be helpful and even your partners will feel like you're, you're listening to them and they're being heard. Next slide, please. And 
so when we're thinking about dysregulated kids, when we're thinking about our kids who are coming into school who have, may have experienced significant loss secondary to COVID, who may have experienced significant stress because a family member lost a job and now they're having, they're experiencing economic hardship. We may be wor working with kids, um, African-American, Black or Latino kids who are coming into school seeing all of the racial unrest in this country and having to discuss and think about racism. And all of these things can be quite traumatic and, and all of these things are forms of toxic stress. And as a result, these kids may be fidgety, they may be more irritable, they may be more reactive, they may appear withdrawn or sad. And so how do we, in those moments, support these children? How do we support, and frankly, any child in the school setting? Dr. Bruce Perry is another child psychiatrist who is fantastic. He wrote a book called The Boy Who Was Raised as a Dog, and it goes through his experiences with children who have experienced trauma. And he came up with this diagram um, or with this kind of flow chart and how we approach and how we support dysregulated kids. And he emphasized, we have to go in order. So when a kid is having a hard time, you, you first must regulate them, meaning helping them calm down, meaning helping that, that lid reattach. So right now their, their lid is flipped. If their lid is flipped and the thinking part is not connected, telling a kid to calm down doesn't work. Like I, I literally would pay someone $100 if you ever got a really dysregulated kid to calm down by just saying calm down. Never seen it work. And that's because again, that processing thinking part is not connected to the survival brain. So first we have to reconnect. We have to calm kids down. And one of, there are a number of things that can do that and we'll talk about some of them that actually can help um, counter toxic stress and decrease the impact of toxic stress, reduce all those stressful hormones and help us to again, use our reasoning brain. So once we regulate a kid, then we relate to them. Then that's, I'm here for you. I care about you. Parents, that's when a kid might need a hug. Teachers, that's when a kid might need you to hold their hand. Some kids even need like physical things like a weighted blanket to feel like they're being held. That's when we're looking the kid in the eye and telling them that we're there for them. But just important to recognize that that relationship has to be present before you try to do this. So if the relationship that you have with a child is primarily punitive um, and they don't see you as a support, this won't work. So you had to have been practicing the reflective listening and practicing being there for them and recognizing their grief well before trying to help them re-regulate. So we regulate, we relate, and then we reason. And that's the reasoning, that's when we can say, wow, that was a really, really big blow up. Let's take a few steps back. What, what happened there? What do you think we can do differently next time? But that part cannot happen until the child's been regulated and they feel safe and supported. And one of the things that Dr. Bruce Perry states is that children need supportive adults. And when we look at research and we look at what makes the biggest difference for kids who have experienced trauma, it's having one supportive adult in their lives who loves them and supports them unconditionally. That adult can certainly be a parent, but that, that adult can be a teacher. That adult can be an administrator. That adult can be a janitor. That can be any adult in their life who they feel like they can connect to and who supports them unconditionally. Next slide, please. And when we're thinking about helping kids regulate, there are lots of things that we can do. But again, we have to think about going from a bottom up approach, not a top down, meaning like we can't necessarily go straight to the thinking part. So calm down or, you know, tell me, you know, of different ways that you can calm down because they may not be able to access that. They may not be able to access the plan that you've discussed. But what does help are sensations. So the things that come up from our spinal cord into our brain, so our five senses. One of my favorite techniques is using Sour Patch Kids. I don't care how upset a kid is, you offer them candy, they'll accept it. And Sour Patch Kids and using taste is a great sense. So when I have kids who are really, really upset in my office, when we were seeing people in person, I have a huge container of Sour Patch Kids. And so when a kid is dysregulated or having a hard time, I'll give them a handful of Sour Patch Kids, tell them to pop it in their mouth and just hold it there. And it kind of gives them that like sour sensation and they almost forget what they were angry about and it re-regulates them. It, it brings their brain, their brain back online. Other things that I, I like are using smell. 
So I know hand sanitizer is at a premium, but there are some scented hand sanitizers and there is a lavender and a peppermint hand sanitizer that I, I really love. And my three-year-old, he's now four, he felt emotions in a big way and would have huge tantrums. So I used to spray lavender hand sanitizer on his hands, have him rub them together and, and breathe in and say, I am calm. His version was, I'm calm. That's how <laughs> he said it. But it was amazing that it worked. So he would take 10 deep breaths and say a little mantra to himself to calm him down and it helped. Other sensory things, soft, hard, coarse. Some kids like the feeling of being held. So having like a stretchy blanket or a weighted blanket. Some kids need to bounce. So you may have even seen in classrooms, kids that have balls instead of chairs. Some kids need more intense sensory experiences like things that are very cold. So my, my six year old, sometimes when he's having a hard time, I'll give him an ice cube and I'll tell him to hold it until it melts. And that's a very intense sensory experience for him and it helps him to calm down. Or I'll tell families, wet a washcloth, tie it, put it in the freezer, and when your kid is having a hard time, give them the washcloth and have them try to untie it. And it's very intense and somewhat painful, and that can be enough for kids who are incredibly dysregulated and need a more intense sensory experience. Other things they can taste, like cinnamon Altoids, a very intense sensory experience, the little hot fireball candies, obviously for older kids that can use them safely. But these but really, thinking outside the box and thinking how we can use our five senses to help our kids calm down. And frankly, this works for adults too. So the same way that our kids' lids get flipped, so, so, so can ours. And so we can use these same techniques for us. Next slide, please. Um, and I, so I'm, I'm running out of time, but um, I'll just mention resilience building means that we're helping kids learn how to manage stress. It doesn't mean that our kids won't have stress. It just means we're teaching them healthy ways to cope so that when additional stressors inevitably come, they're better able to handle it. And mindfulness is, an, is a great exercise that helps to build resilience and helps to decrease stress. And when we've actually looked at MRIs of people who engage in a regular practice of mindfulness, it literally does the opposite of what stress does to the brain. And so again, mindfulness is just being present, being in the moment, taking deep breaths, experiencing what you're experiencing the now. So how do your clothes feel on your back? What are you hearing? What are you smelling? What are you seeing? This was uh, my now four-year-old um, doing a mindfulness exercise. For whatever reason, he loves hats and he doesn't love pants and I cannot get him to wear pants consistently. So this COVID works for him because now he just never wears pants, but this was him doing an exercise because again, he had, he experienced really big emotions. So we had to practice this pretty consistently and we still do to try to help him calm down. And when we've looked at mindfulness in schools, when it's embedded into the school curriculum, it makes a huge difference for learning. Kids learning improves, the disciplinary actions decrease. And when they remove mindfulness from the schools, these, the issues go back up again. The disciplinary practices increase once again. Next slide, please. These are just a, a few resources that I would recommend for both parents and for teachers if you're wanting to understand what it means to be a trauma-informed parent, a trauma-informed teacher, or a trauma-informed school. These are all great resources. Um, the link at the bottom is actually a full training module that's completely free and available to anyone. So even if you're a parent and you would just want to understand what it means to be more trauma-informed, go to this. It, it can never hurt to be more trauma-informed, even if your child has never experienced trauma or if you don't think they've experienced trauma. It's always helpful to understand how to relate to kids and how to support them if they've had a negative experience. Next slide, please. These are just a, a list of um, resources. And um, I think we'll talk about this later, but on, on my website, wellmindsconsulting.com under resources, I have um, a list of grounding techniques and mindfulness that you can use. I have resources about becoming anti-racist as well as resources for how to manage COVID-19. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Christian Brathwaite. That was wonderful. Now let me introduce Dr. Robert Macy. Dr. Robert Macy is a pioneer of evidence-based traumatic stress reduction and disaster relief programs with decades of experience in the field. 
He has worked in school systems and with kids and families during stressful times over the last 30 years. So please welcome Dr. Robert Macy. Thank you. Good evening. Thank you, Anastina. And thank you, Dr. Christian Braithwaite, for what you've been doing, your practice, and how extraordinary your presentation is. Next slide, please. Um, it's going to work out well because what um, Nicole has set up for us as listeners and learners um, is really the structure of how to help your kids regulate with some very specific concrete things to do. What I'd like to address and have us think about now is given the framework that Nicole has set up, can we do surviving to thriving, especially during the pandemic? And the pandemic, unfortunately, is not just COVID, but it's the ongoing racism in our country, uh, continued exposure to violence for, for kids around our country. So the thing I've seen, and I'm a parent of five, uh, I'd never had to raise my kids during COVID because they're all grown and out of the house. But the way I see it at this point, parents are expected to be one, great parents, which means you never blow up and you're always calm, you do everything right. Two, now you're supposed to be educators and teachers. You're also now supposed to be public health, if you will, experts and protectors for your kids and your family. You're supposed to be a great spouse or partner for your partner. And you're also supposed to be a great friend to your friends. Next slide, please. That's a lot of roles to fulfill, maybe too many. But what the studies have shown over the last 20 years with respect to critical trauma theory and development and parenting is that the parent needs to think about how they start with the relationship to themselves. And all the studies show that everything that was beautifully laid out by Nicole is only going to be successful if you yourself are practicing, as she suggested, in terms of your relationship with yourself. Next slide. Next slide. Thank you. So Nicole had mentioned earlier, along with Dr. Perry, that um, a brain is not born, a brain is built. Well, resiliency is very similar. We are born with resiliency abilities, but we have to practice them. We have to build our resiliency. And so I'd just like you to think for a minute as we move towards our question and answer period, can you build of practice with your family of resilience. And one of the issues at hand now, because COVID is, is so global and has taken so many lives and created such complex loss scenarios and grief scenarios, is we can ask ourselves, and this is part of what Nicole also mentioned in terms of meaning making and grief. So I'm gonna ask you, it's, it may be an intense question, but are you worthy of surviving? You mom, you dad, you partner. And is your family worthy of surviving? And I'm hoping you all have already decided, yes, that's absolutely the case. And if so, good for you. And you can remind yourself that that is a very courageous act that you decide, yes, we're worthy of surviving. So how do we build our practice of resiliency? Next slide, please. So this is a, a really wonderful diagram that supports all of the work that um, Nicole was, was suggesting you consider. Uh, so the fancy title for this is Early Intervention Principles. Um, but these are principles that you would use anytime you're doing an intervention, doing a relationship with a child, with a partner, but I'm going to say first with you yourself. So in order for you to end up feeling connected or eff effective with peers or hopeful, those aren't going to come unless you first have some safety and calming. So the way it works, it's clockwise, so you build safety. That safety allows you to begin calming. Safety and calming allow you to be begin to build connectedness with self first and then other. And then a sense of efficacy or being effective in the eyes of your peers, especially during COVID. And all of that can help support the regaining of, the rebuilding of, the rediscovering of hope. I think most of you have heard, if you haven't experienced it yourself, of other stories where people have been so devastated by the virus and the other things that are going on right now that you almost feel like you can't hope, that you're not sure where your future is. And that is a, a pretty normal experience when you are faced with overwhelming events. <clears throat> so what we suggest with, with this perspective is don't, don't try to force yourself into hope again. Allow yourself to begin to build your resiliency practice, which starts with building safety, calming, connectedness, 
and efficacy in relationships, first with yourself and then your family. Next slide, please. One of the things we've learned over the last 30 years is that human beings have a very difficult time with change because all change equals loss. Whether it's loss of a loved one, whether it's a change of uh, house, whether it's a change of job, which has happened, whether you have to stay home, which is a big change. And that represents loss and loss can lead to grief. Loss is experienced most acutely during transitions. So for instance, if we stay very concrete at the family level, when your children are waking up in the morning, when they have to come to the table, when they have to leave the table, when they have to go to bed at night, those are changes in posture and environment and activity. And that's when, if they are struggling with stress and potentially toxic stress and grief, their sense of loss allows them to go into survival mode. That's how the body helps survive. If they go into a survival mode as was discussed earlier. So what you can think about as parents is, and as home environment with your own teaching, since you're in schools, um, since you're, you're using your home as schools, is during the transitions, what can I do which would allow my kids to be able to adapt to the lost, loss and go and move forward? So Nicole's given you a lot of really good information and ideas about what to do to help a kid regulate. So think about using some of the sensory motor work during, before and during the transitions. Okay, managing transitions effectively, as we've just been describing, depends on how you know yourself and you need to understand, which is hard. What are you, what are you mom, dad, what are you in control of and what can't you control? And this is part of meaning making and resilience. Being able to look out there and look inward and say, okay, I can be in control of this, which is normally your own reactions, but you can't necessarily change politics. We can't change the course of COVID. So make a list first with yourself and then your partner. What are you in control of and what aren't you in control of? And then spend energy and time and love and togetherness looking at what you can control. And one of the coolest ways to do that, which has already been spoken about, so I'm gonna give you just a different view of the same science, is understanding how to redistribute blood flow in your brain. Next slide, please. So I like this slide because it's great for kids as well as parents. So you can see here that you've got, we're looking from the back of the brain forward. So this is similar to Nicole's work and Dan's work uh, with the hand model. But we have a front of the brain, a back of the brain, a right side of the brain, a left side of the brain, a top of the brain, and a bottom of the brain. What we've learned through imaging is that when you start to get very upset, that's always, always accompanied with high heart rate, pulse rate, and an increase in breathing, and an increase in pressure, and sometimes inflammation. When that happens, or when the lid is flipped, as Nicole would say, the blood is recruited from the front of the brain, the top of the brain, and the two sides of the brain to the back, to the right rear quadrant of the brain, which is most deeply connected to your survival brain or your reptile brain. Now that's a very elegant system because the system is saying, hey, we need more support back here in order to fight and flight. We've got to have more, more energy, more resource. So send that back. The issue is that when you bring the blood back to the right rear of the brain, there's less blood here. And as Nicole said in the thinking part. So this part becomes hypometabolized or it has less access to blood flow. And this has so much access to blood flow that it makes you pressurized, but it's also what's allowed you to survive. And Nicole actually gave a great example. And I'm sure most of you experienced this. She was talking about driving. And I will just say, Nicole, even us people from Massachusetts can have our lid flip when we're driving with other Massachusetts drivers. It's just the culture, I guess. But think of a time when you were got so upset, right? Quote, spitting mad. You were so mad that you almost couldn't speak. And if you could speak, you'd have three or four words and there might be four letters, right? That's because the left and front part of your brain where your language centers are, don't have enough blood to speak. So as our first presenter said, you can't just start with calm down. And what I'm trying to help us think about tonight is as a parent, and now your parent teacher, parent teacher partner, parent teacher partner, public health expert, allow yourself 
to begin some practices if you haven't already that can help you redistribute your blood flow. So when you do what we did at the beginning with the Bob Marley sensory and just doing diaph diaphragmatic breathing, it allows the blood to start moving back to the front and sides of the brain. So think of this almost as an engineering system and you have the ability to redistribute this blood flow. Next slide, please. When your child is not listening to you, when your child is being disruptive, or as Nicole said, when they're really reactive, when they're overwhelmed with emotions, what punishment, what sanction works best? Now we've learned just the last 30 minutes that talking them down doesn't work, especially if all that blood flow is in the right rear of their brain. So we have to start with the regulation process, how to calm them down. And one of the ways, which has actually been around for a while, but sometimes t parents haven't learned about this, is rather than timing a kid out where you put him in the corner and you make him sit still, by the way, that very rarely works, especially depending on how, <clears throat> how long you make him sit there and how old they are. So if you have a six-year-old and you put him time out for 20 minutes, after the first three or four minutes, they're not going to get why they're still sitting in that chair. So I'm gonna suggest you try something which does take away time from you cooking the dinner, cleaning the house, or doing all the other things you have to do. But we suggest a time in, which is the same thing as Nicole was talking about, go, go to relationship. And you will have to practice this. It's not gonna work unless you've been practicing this with your kid when they're not that upset. So when they do get upset, you are both in the practice mode of instead of pushing each other away and isolating, you come together, they sit on your lap, or you sit next to each other in a chair and you just calm down with some breath work, with some sensory work. And then you can turn to them and you can say a couple of things. One, I normally say, wow, that was scary. I'm so glad you're okay. And the other really great question, even for younger ones is what do you need most right now? So we're really turning it to them to begin to give, allow them to give their voice to you in terms of how they're gonna survive. Next slide, please. So I think we'll just stick with the diaphragmatic breathing that Nicole showed you. What I'd like you to understand and play around with is when you do that and using music is great, using uh, any other sensory smell is fabulous. The idea is Nicole mentioned, you wanna breathe out more than you breathe in. So we do a three, six. It doesn't matter whether it's through your nose or your mouth, but we'd like you to allow your exhale to be twice the duration of your inhale. So if you breathe in a count of three, you're gonna breathe out a count of six. Then you take a normal regular breath, then you do a three, six again. Eventually your body will get used to that and you can do a four, eight. Now you can do this a couple of cycles and you'll notice a change in your heart rate and your breath rate and you'll start to calm. That's because when you breathe out long enough, it activates a certain part of that old brain that releases serotonin and oxytocin. Those are the chill chemicals we have that are the antidote to uh, adrenaline and, and cortisol. So you actually have a dimmer switch if you want to, your upsetness and to the chemicals that are reactive in the service of survival by allowing yourself to calm down. And saying calm down doesn't work. If you say, I'm gonna calm down and you use the breath work, it will work. Next slide, please. So we have resources available that uh, Dr. Christian Braithwaite just showed you. Uh, there are handouts, which we will be sending to via email at the end of this presentation, um, including some of the breath work. And uh, would just ask you all, with everything else you're having to do as parents, allow yourself to give your own self compassion. You give compassion to your friends, to your kiddos, to your partners, but you can take some of your amazing parenting, teaching, compassion and turn it towards yourself and allow yourself the practice of beginning to calm yourself down. You deserve it. You're worthy of survival, allowing yourself to regulate. Thank you. Okay. Now's I think the most fun part. We've got lots and lots of people in our Zoom room here. Thank you for being here. We want to turn this over to you. We'd love to hear your voice. Your voice is your choice. Okay. Now, as been mentioned, we've got, you know, about 700 folks plus. So I can tell you honestly, and you know, we're not gonna get to the 700 questions. We're also counting on that because we've all been through this lived experience 
as parents, a lot of us probably have very similar questions. So we promise you we're trying to gonna, we're gonna try to get to the major themes and the questions that you have, understanding that if we answer one person's questions, we're hoping that answer might go out to several other questions. The questions are gonna be um, given to Anastina and she'll be voicing them for both Nicole and I to answer as best we can. So good luck and uh, please jump in now with your questions. So I have a question for, I'm going to throw it out to both of you and then see where that goes. Um, and this is actually a question that has come up a couple times through conversations that we've had um, with teachers throughout the state, which is what are some good techniques to use virtually? How can we bridge the gaps over Zoom with students? Um, I mean, that, that's a great question. And I'm sure Robert has many suggestions too. I would say, one of the, the most important things, again, is relationship. And a lot of the early part of school will have to be doing more one-on-one -on -one work with kids. So one thing that I, I certainly recommend is a giving kids voice. So giving them a say in the rules of the classroom, giving them a say in what feels safe. And so I would even say starting school off and asking the students, what does a safe Zoom classroom look like to you? What would a safe teacher-student relationship look like to you? What is a safe peer relationship look like to you? And having kids tell you what they feel comfortable with and then you using their feedback to actually create the rules, spending one-on-one -on -one time with kids. So some kids may not be in an environment where they feel comfortable turning their video on. That's not a conversation that should be had in a large group. That's a conversation that you can have individually with that child letting them know that you're here, letting them know that you understand them. And so I think that's one of the first things because if they trust you and they feel connected to you, then it makes it much easier to manage them in, in the larger group setting. Beautiful. Only thing I would add, um, in setting up an environment, we're giving the kids a big choice. Um, because it's partly because it's virtual, we would do this if we had them in the classroom anyway. Um, but yeah, having them build their own safety guidelines and then once that's done, which can be done in one session, it, it depends, even, even with the adolescents, certainly with the younger kids, whatever you're gonna be doing in terms of discussion and allowing choice with video on or off, which I know is, can be crazy making, but if you can have them doing an activity while you're teaching, have them manipulating instruments, Play-Doh, maps, um, have them building something so that their bodies are active. The last thing I would just recommend, because I'm a dance movement therapist and my team does, a, we continue to be now virtual for the last five, six months, but we're doing movement work, we're doing breath work, we're doing music, we're doing dancing. Um, and kids don't have to have their video on if they want. Most kids will turn it on when the dancing starts or when you're doing a movement activity because they want to see each other. So it's a great way to warm up the body, redistribute the blood flow and allow them to feel some community. Nice, thank you. Here's another one. Um, what approaches do we have if when you ask a child, what do you need most right now? And they say, leave me alone. So I, I would say using reflective <laughs> listening. Um, so, it, you know, okay. So it sounds like right now, what you need is some alone time. So how about we take five minutes and you can go into a safe place or if you want, you can turn your camera on and then we can check back in in five minutes. Um, and, you know, again, letting them know you hear them, but that you still have to keep them safe and that you want to return to try to, to figure out a solution. Nice. You know, the, that prompt question, what do you need most right now is very powerful. So I'm just going to ask all of us as adults when you use that, before you use it, you need to have a practice of this resiliency piece around mindfulness and calming. But there's something else that I, I always remind myself of. It's a great, it's a great um, acronym. It's called Q-tip. We all know what a Q-tip is, but this is different. Q-tip means quit taking it personally. Now, if, if someone's hurting you, that's different. But, and this question, I think, is probably both virtual, but let's say you're in your own home and you ask a child who's really upset your kid, what do you need most right now? And they say, I need, I need, just leave me alone, right? Don't take that personally. 
what I, what I do, but I've had a lot of training is I get excited. And I, what I would feedback is, wow, good for you. You're trying to take care of yourself. Do you want some time without me? Can I come back in, in five minutes? I'll bring some water and leave you alone and come back in five minutes. But good for you. You're trying to take care of yourself. So you're looking for the, the fight or flight has with it something besides freeze and it's called appraisal. So even little kids, their bodies go into watching the environment, trying to figure out how can I get safe? So when they, if they say right away, when you say, what do you need most right now? Hey, leave me alone. They're trying to figure out how to calm themselves and get safe. Now you're, your, you're their parent. So you could take that very personally, but I would just be excited that the kid is trying to figure it out. He's in survival mode and survivorship is brilliant. It's a 235,000 year old system that we were walking around with and knows what to do. So trust your, trust your kid's brain and spine. They know what to do. The mind is different, yeah, but the brain and spine tend to work towards less toxic stress, less inflammation and calming. We just have to help them with that environment. Um, thank you. Let's see. Do you have any good tips on how parents can take care of themselves at this time while collectively experiencing very high stress trauma together with their children? Is that a parking lot question, Dr. Macy? No, I think, I bet okay. Nicole, I bet I'd love to hear what Nicole has to say. <laughs> um, so, I mean, I, I was gonna, Robert, if you, if you wanted to, to take that one first, um, but um, so there, I mean, so everything that we do for our kids, we also have to do for ourselves. Um, and there, you know, there that, that old saying, like, put your mask on first. We have to first be regulated, as, as Robert was mentioning before, we regulate our kids. And so one of the things that I have to practice before I work with my four and six year old is I have to practice regulating my own emotion. So I, there are a couple things that I do. I have um, a, a, an appreciation journal, uh, a journal where I write down maybe not nightly, but I try to, about what I appreciated during the day. So I can have what we would describe as like a cognitive shift. So I'm no longer focused on just the negative. I can also shift and focus on the positive. And I do the same exercise with my kids before bed. Like what, name one thing you were grateful for today. Today was a rough day, but can we identify one good thing? And you know, my kids, my six-year-old is you know very grumpy and nothing is good. You didn't let me have ice cream. I couldn't go outside, nothing is good. And I'm like, yeah, but at lunch, you told me your apple was really yummy. He's like, well, all right, maybe the apple was good. Awesome. <laughs> that's, that's one good thing that we can be grateful for. And even that, like, it changes your temperament. It changes the feeling, and it helps to kind of loosen the muscles and, and reduce the stress. But um, as I mentioned on my <laughs> website under resources, there's a COVID-19 handout that's like a couple pages long, and that has a number of different things that, that adults can do um, to help calm themselves down. As Robert said, controlling what you can control. So one of the things that trauma takes from us is our control. Tra trauma it takes away our power and our control. And so the way that you address that is building in control. And so if the only thing you can control is what time you eat lunch, then control that. If the only thing that you can control is watching TV after your kids go to bed, then that's what you can control. And that's a part of your self-care routine. Self-care doesn't need to be a spa day. Self-care can be eight hours of sleep. Self-care can be making sure that you ate dinner. So, you know, and so you can kind of determine self-care for me is watching Avengers movies as many times as I can. Um, and that's a part of my self-care. So sorry, that was a long-winded answer. <laughs> no, that was, that was fabulous. Thank you. And let me just underscore two things. We use appreciation circles almost every day with the work we do and with my family. So you can do it one-to-one, -one, but if you're having at a dinner, near the end of the dinner, which is a transition, you're breaking up as a family community in a circle, sharing bread to go off and do your things and kids are facing homework and going to bed. The, the ritual to close dinner to help with the transition into the new space would be let's go around and you can just say pass if you want, but think about this and maybe name one appreciation you've had in this moment or during this day. And if no one says anything, say, okay, great. Do it again the next night. Do rinse and repeat, it's really important for self-care for community and family. The other quick formula I'll give you for you parents that are asking this question, um, and uh, please check out the, um, the materials that Nicole has and that I sent. They're very, very specific, so you get a lot of good ideas. But think of the, the three legs of the stool, the triad. 
for, for, for compassion care, for what you can do for yourself. H2O, O2, and social connections. I know that sounds very simple, but staying hydrated is key to flushing out toxic stress chemicals. Oxygen is a very powerful substance. And guess what hates oxygen? Adrenaline and cortisol. Oxygen hypermetabolizes adrenaline and cortisol. So you want to stay oxygenated, whether you're doing some push-ups, some jumping jacks, a walk. And then third, and certainly not least, is social connections. And here I'm just going to be a little bit blunt. Partly because of COVID, we have many connections. And it's, it, that's so important because we're so sequestered and isolated. But I'm guessing that all of us in this Zoom room have one or two social connections that may be driving us a little bit crazy. Now, I'm not saying we need to go to divorce court. God forbid that it would be that. I'm not saying you have to write somebody off your list, but you're allowed to do what I call detachment care or unattachment care just for a little bit. So you go through your biggest social connections and you say, who are the people when I'm with them, I feel like they really love and trust me. I know they would walk across the desert for me. And I would say up your time with them and the other folks who may be critical in your life, who really are energy suckers and just are depending on you so much that you really don't look forward talking to them, gently, slowly, diplomatically decrease some of your time with them. It's okay for you to choose social connections that actually increase your immune system health, which are those connections that when you work with them, you feel equal and you feel really loved and trusted. Here's a good one. How to encourage kids to participate in Zoom meetings for school, <laughs> therapy, doctor's appointments, et cetera, since kids are often resistant. Well, Dr. Christian Braithworth, I'm sure you're going to answer that one. <laughs> um, you know, and this is, so some of these things don't have easy answers, right? Like this is new for a lot of us and everyone has Zoom fatigue. At the end of the day, like I can't look at a computer screen. Um, and so we, a lot of it is compromise with kids and giving them some level of agency. And okay, so I know you hate Zoom, but how about we do 20 minutes of, of Zoom and then you and I take a walk together or 30 minutes of Zoom and 10 minutes of the screen time that you actually want. Um, and so it's, or, you know, I, I always talk about giving kids choices, but the choices really aren't our choices. So my son will say, I want pizza for dinner. And I'm like, well, we don't have pizza. We can have chicken or we can have hot dogs. I want pizza. And I'm like, you know what? I know that it's so difficult that you want pizza, but that's maybe something we can do another day. But I really value your opinion. I would love to know if you had to choose between chicken and hot dogs, which one would you choose? And then he'll make the choice. And I'm like, absolutely great choice. That was an amazing choice. And so giving him the feeling that he had a say when he really necessarily didn't, but feeling like he has some control. And so you're going to have to work with your teens um, or even you know younger kids and find some compromise. Maybe they need to eat when they're doing a Zoom. Maybe they need to, as Robert was saying, having a distraction, snacks are, a great way to help calm kids down. And so when class starts, maybe they need a warm cup of milk or maybe they need um, carrots or a fruit snack or something to snack on to help them distract them. Or if they even have a toy, and I know it's hard to get kids to focus with a toy, but if they have one fidget that they can use and still try to focus, that can even be helpful, but it's not easy. Um, and, it, and it does take some time and it does take some, um, some bargaining. I will echo um, the very last piece that Nicole was talking about. Um, we, we tend to, as te if you're a teacher or a parent and a teacher, now all your parents have to be teachers, we tend to worry that the kids aren't gonna focus enough, that they're not paying attention, that they're not gonna learn. And we don't wanna throw that out the window. We wanna care about their learning and we wanna care about academic progression. The problem right now is the environment isn't conducive to that, although everyone's saying it is, but honestly, it's not. But parts of the Zoom environment can be. And so what we're counseling schools to think about, and we, don't, we can't lay down the law, but if a kid has a Lincoln log set, a crossword puzzle, a jigsaw puzzle, a, a, um, a doll, um, a coloring book, let them do that activity while they're listening on Zoom. Here's our issue, and it's everybody's issue, and could we call calling it Zoom fatigue, but this gets back to critical trauma theory. We are purposely placing ourselves in immo immobilization postures, and human beings don't do well with immobilization. 
right? So one of the things we tell in classrooms is absolutely break every 20 to 24 minutes. A developing spine shouldn't be stationary for more than 24 minutes. You're going to get the blood flow issue again. The blood's going to leave the front of the brain and go towards the back of the brain because it's sensing this immobilization or this being pinned down. So having a kid be active while you're doing the 20 minutes of instruction and then having the kid break, you're going to, we're going to get a much better outcome, us and the kiddos. So you tell the kids, you're dosing it like, like Nicole just said, you know, 20 minutes, but tell them, look, let's pick out some activities that you can keep yourself busy with so you don't have to just be staring at the screen. And you can still listen to your teacher or listen to whoever, but you can be active. I mean, the coloring books, you can get the pre-designed you know, pre, uh, coloring books and just many adults do that on Zoom right now. Adults do that when we're meeting in person, right? So you come up with some strategies and, and then work with the kids. Say, okay, let's pick 10 activities that are your go-to activities when you're doing a Zoom. And you can go through them during the week. Let's go out shopping for those and build a, build a Zoom box that's their magic box so they can bring something out and still be engaged, but they don't have to put their full intention to it. That's not, that's not their job as a kid to learn that way. Can I just say, I'm one of those adults that like has an adult coloring book and like, this is, this is what I did during a meeting today. So <laughs> those people that cannot sit still and I have like literally a bag of color pencils. So for me, I think it, it can work for everybody. <laughs> that's great. Um, next question. We have a 17 year old who has such an in increasing anxiety that she cannot sleep. She has been waking up at 1, 2, 3, and 4 a.m. Now we are all sleep deprived. What can we do? Nicole, this is yours. <laughs> um, so I, you know, I would say certainly trying some of the techniques that we've discussed, but it's important to recognize that if a child's anxiety or if their mood swings or mood lability is impacting their quality of life, it's impacting your quality of life or it becomes a safety issue, it goes beyond doing these techniques. That's when it goes to actually reaching out for support. Um, you know, and that can be done in a variety of ways, going through organizations like Mass Support, going through, um, if you live in, Metro Boston, like the best team, or if you live in other parts of Massachusetts, Riverside Community Care has, a, has an, um, an urgent care team. So they're, or calling your primary care doctor and checking in with them, and maybe they have recommendations. There are various websites. So Psychology Today is one website where a lot of therapists post information about their private practice. Uh, a local psychologist named Charmaine Jackman uh, created a website called InnoPsych. It's I-N-N-O-P-S-Y-C-H. And it's a website dedicated to therapists and psychiatrists of color. So if you specifically are looking for a person of color, you can go to her website and find that. There's a website called um, Therapy for Black Girls. There's one called Therapy for Black Boys. Uh, NAMI is a great website. So there are various places. And, and this is a lot of, you know, to do. But I think if it's to the point where it's disturbing her sleep, she's not functioning, it's impacting her, you know, day-to-day -day life or what we call ADLs, where like showering, eating, the basic things that you need to survive, then, then it, you need to kind of escalate the level of support. Keep doing these things, keep practicing deep breathing. There's some great guided imagery um, videos that you can watch on YouTube that you can go through before bed. I, I used to do that with my kids. One of the, the things that my kids love we would, they would tell me wherever their favorite place is, and we would describe it. We would talk about the smells, the sounds, the colors. And then as they're going to bed, almost like hypnosis, I would say we're, we're on a cloud and we're floating over wherever their favorite place is. And I would talk about how calming it is, how relaxing it is, using some of the descriptions that they gave me and starting to suggest how tired they are and how relaxed they are and how calming this is to be floating on the cloud. And so they're various activities and guided imagery that we can do with kids to help them calm down. But if you've tried all these things and it hasn't worked or you're concerned about safety, you really need to, to take it to a professional. Thank right. you. Well, now, now I know who to call. <laughs> well, just to the, to, the, to the wonderful answer that Nicole just gave, just like a Zoom magic box, have a little resource kit. Don't do this alone. Parents don't have to do this alone. You can have build a team around you, a care team around you, your primary care doc, other potential healers, and certainly behavioral health specialists. The other thing I would just mention, and with compassion and respect for 
the questioner and for all of us parents, if you have one child that's highly anxious in a family and you have another child or two and your partner, there is a family piece to this. So I would just caution you not to say to your 17 year old, okay, we're gonna get you to a shrink. We're gonna get you some help. You may wanna be discussing with the rest of the family. Do we all need to see somebody to talk about how this is impacting us? All right, next question. A significant element to development we have not been able to practice as much lately has been socialization, particularly for our children. With the dependency of learning through virtual platforms, students will not have the same opportunities to connect and socialize. How can we help to socialize our children safely and promote this skill set? I'll give that one to you first, Robert. <laughs> beautiful, beautiful question. Thank you. Well, you may have to pull me in from the outer edge, Nicole, but um, I've been doing a lot of thinking about this and, and we've been researching it, my research teams and, and traumatologists with respect to socialization, social connection, you know, negative and positive. It's such a beautifully put question. Um, so I want to be respectful and I want to offer you an idea. So there's a, a book that came out now 10 years ago. It was called um, Nature Deficit Disorder. And the opening page is a quote by a six-year-old. And the quote is, my favorite place to play is inside because that's where all the electrical outlets are. Now this was way pre-COVID. And I'm not, I'm, I'm not, I'm gonna be the last person in the world to start lambasting social media and screen time. There's lots to talk about there, but here's something we've forgotten. And the studies are very strong on this. Um, you can socialize with other than humans. The, the human animal has an extraordinary ability to imprint, to attach to landscape. So I'm talking about nature. Now I know the winter's coming, but thinking about how you get your kids outside, how you get you and your kids outside. If you have pets, you may want to think about getting a pet. Now this doesn't take the place of human connection and attachment, but it continues to foster social development. And it fosters the dendrites in the nerves of our brain to grow when a kid is challenged by attaching to nature. So it's, it's a consideration. Failing that, um, you know, we've got this distancing and this transmis transmission piece that we're gonna be dealing with for a while longer. So I think setting up some ideas, some activity ideas like, a, like your Zoom kit and your resource for psychology, what are some attachment activities you can do that would include, of course, you all, but nature and animals? Um, so I, I, I agree completely. I think we also have to be creative. Um, so there are a couple ways that we can use Zoom even to enhance socialization. One thing that my, my son likes to do with some of his friends, we'll do a scavenger hunt. So we'll email a list of outdoor items that kids have to find and we literally have our cameras on and we're all on Zoom together and they're walking through whatever park they're in and we're walking through whatever park and we're finding the things on our list. And it's a competition, it's who can find it first. And so if it's an acorn, we show everyone on Zoom, like I found an acorn and we can you know, check off and we have a point. And the kids love it and they're talking and they're chatting um, and we're having you know, our shared experiences in nature and outdoors. And it, it seems to be a, a really great experience, but also you know, social distancing and masking works. And if you're able to have kids outdoors doing an activity that doesn't require social touch, then you can, they can absolutely socialize. So soccer, for example, is a great activity. My, my sons with a couple of our neighbors, every Saturday, there's a large field down the street from our house and they wear masks even when they're outside and they just kick the ball around and they don't, they're not close to each other. They permanently remain six feet away, but it's, a, again, they can talk to each other. They can laugh sometimes even after they'll go hunting for bees, but then they just go shrink screaming as soon as they see a bee, but it's, it's an activity that they really enjoy. And so we really have to try to be creative because, um, you know, socialization is often a coping skill for a lot of kids. And also just important to think about our teenagers you may not know it, but they're still socializing. And so it's just important to, to make sure that we're talking to our kids, continuing about like safe sex, about the, you know, substances. Like these are all things that are still happening. Adolescents find a way. 
Um, and so just making sure that we don't assume it's not happening with our older kids and that we're still having conversations with them about how to be safe from a COVID perspective, but other perspectives as well. All right, thank you. How much information should I give my child about the pandemic? How old? They don't say. Okay. Well, I, I'll give a sort of a, a ground rule. You know, you, have, you, you know your kid better than I do, um, but too much information is not helpful. Um, so depending on the child's age, their lived experience, um, you're going to give, you're going to tell them enough transparently and honest to frame what the issue is. But going into large scale numbers and into um, deep detailed explanations is not necessarily helpful. As they get older, and I'm sure I'd love Nicole to, to jump in on this, as they get older, I would want to do it as a discovery piece. Um, so you could use whatever media you need to use to look at what's happening today with COVID. Um, look at the, let kids know that the whole world is doing this. This is not just your neighborhood. And so they're really clear that this is impacting the whole world and that there are science groups that are tracking this in order to get us safe and keep us safe. I think that's a really important thing to emphasize and show them again, depending on the, the, the age of their intellect, you can show them some of the things that very, very amazing people are doing to decrease transmission, treat people, and stop the, the march of COVID. And I think with everything, it's talking to them, you know, on a developmental level that they understand. So talking to them, you know, where, where they're at. Even, you know, one thing I would say is trying to avoid having kids watch the news because the way the news presents information in a 24-hour news cycle, it's not healthy for adults to watch, frankly. So it's certainly not healthy for kids yeah. to watch. And so you want to control what your kids are seeing. So one, being aware, depending on the age, being aware of what they're taking in on social media. So everything that they're looking at, you should also be looking at because the a lot of social media videos play automatically. So murders of black people that are happening, those will play automatically. Those are not videos that are helpful or healthy for anyone to watch, but particularly a developing brain. Um, but making sure that you understand the information that they're seeing. So asking them first what their understanding is and our kids surprise us they're they're so smart and they're so resilient so before explaining covid to a kid asking like what what do you know about all that's happening with this virus what are your thoughts about it and so before just giving information making sure that we're clarifying any misconceptions or misunderstandings um and then talking to them in a way that they understand if these are younger kids talking to them about like things that make people sick and the reason that we're wearing the masks and staying apart is that this is these are ways that we know help the, avoid the spread of the illness or why can't we see nana and papa as often and the same things that we can kind of ex explain it there are also a lot of resources so uh, a colleague of mine dr ebony hilton she's an anesthesiologist she wrote a children's book um called we're going to be okay. And it's free. It's a free children's book about COVID. Um, and there are a couple of others, uh, children's books about COVID. So if you, go, if you Google children's books about COVID, um, or if you even Google Dr. Dr. Ebony Hilton, that, that book will come up and you can even use that as a guide. Yeah. And just to tag on um, one of the handout, two of the handouts that I'm, I'm sending you are from the National Child Traumatic Stress Network. And they specifically address talking about COVID to kids. We're going to end with one more question, and um, and I just want to remind people that all the resources that Dr. Christian Braith Brathwaite, as well as Dr. Macy mentioned, are on both th their websites as well as our website. So just one more question. Um, the question is how to talk to children about coping with their and others' risk tolerance, specifically when certain children are more vigilant and more uncomfortable in hybrid classroom? What are some phrasing for children to say if someone gets too close? So what are some respectful options? It's a um, good question. No, that, that is, that is a, it's a great question. Um, and so, if we, again, you can be creative and kind of work with your kid and even practice at home ahead of time. And so, again, Ask your kid first. So if someone comes too close to you, what are you? What are some things that you think you could say to them? 
And so brainstorm with them, again, allowing the answer to come from them first and feeding off of that. So like my, my six-year-old says, wherever his arms reach is his bubble. And we talk about that in general, about safe body and you know him being too close to people and other people being too close to him. So wherever my arms reach is my bubble. And I would really appreciate if you stayed out of my bubble. And he is very bl blunt. And so that's just kind of how it is. Of course, kids will forget. Um, and sometimes an easy thing is just to physically step back. But the best thing you can do when returning to school in the hybrid model or if you have kids that are going full time is you have to practice everything. You have to practice hand washing. So making sure that they are singing their ABCs and washing, getting under their nails, getting everything. Um, so practicing hand proper hand washing because most kids will like rinse and go. And so they're not they're not fully lathering. Um, practicing wearing the mask appropriately, practicing not putting your finger wherever kids' fingers goes around their face um, and practicing how to keep yourself safe and how to keep a distance. Uh, but all of that, again, this is a conversation and that can go back and forth. Thank you. And I, it's amazing how quickly this time went by. And I just wanna thank all the parents and our attendees, teachers, whomever's out there asking these amazing questions. And we didn't get to all of them. And I just want to assure you that, um, as I said before, we're going to take them and use them and it'll help inform our next town hall. Um, and then likewise, you know, all the resources that I mentioned as well. So we're going to conclude right now with Sarah Gare, who is the Western Mass team lead. Thank you, Anastina. Um, so what about you? We've talked a lot about kids and the brain and thanks to um, both Dr. Macy and Dr. Christian Brathwaite, we did talk about the importance of you, but also to think about the importance of your whole family unit. This is a very difficult time for all of us, and everyone in not only Massachusetts, but America is trying to figure out how to cope with um, this experience. And one thing is just to remember that I think, and I think both of our panelists would agree with this statement, the most important thing is that your children feel valued, loved, and safe. And education we can catch up on. And the good news is um, we are all in this boat, meaning all of us, including myself, um, we're trying to figure out how to make sure our kids get good educations, but we also want them um, to know that they are loved and safe. Uh, next slide, please. So the question becomes, we spend a lot of time as a culture thinking about the harm that happens to us and we talk about trauma and all of the impact, but the reality is that we are also very resilient beings. Um, when we think about resilience, it's not about us going back to the way that we were. We often talk about the new normal. Um, we don't know when things will go back or that they will go back to the way that they once were, but what we do know um, is that we have the ability to transform this stress that we're all experience and move it out of being the toxic stress that Dr. Nicole referenced into being the tolerable stress. And so to think about the ways in which we can do that, and if we can do it, we can actually come out, believe it or not, in the side of having post-traumatic growth, which means that as people, as families, as communities, we can actually get stronger through all of this um, if, if we're able to take good care of ourselves and each other. Next slide, Greg. Oh, actually, we were going to skip this one. Sorry. Can we go to the next one? Thanks so much. So how do we do it? I am not a doctor, but I play one on Twitter. No, I don't. That would be totally unethical. But if I did, um, and I'm sure that this prescription our doctors on board today would sign off on, this is the prescription that I would give to all of us right now. Um, and so just to think about some of these things, one is that positive attitude. We are all guilty of having moments of not having such a great attitude. We're quick to notice when other people's attitudes aren't so good, um, but really having that awareness about our own attitude and how to take these suggestions and ideas. Um, I was laughing, Dr. Nicole, here's my Altoids. Uh, and so how to take these things and use them for ourselves. Also to give ourselves a timeout sometimes, take a break, step away, um, take good care of ourselves you know, to find a resilient role model, to find someone around us who is managing well and to have the courage to say to them, how are you doing this? Uh, and to be willing to listen and to think about um, ways to, to do these things. And also working on developing our active coping skills all of the time. So, you know, seeing and noticing the ways in which we struggle with things and how to get through them. 
we have to attend to our own physical well-being. We are hearing from people around the state about sleep disturbances. So when that question popped up, um, that makes total sense. We are hearing about it for adults, for young people, for our, our older adults. Um, we know that sleep hygiene is really, really important. Um, and so, you know, paying attention to our overall well-being, making sure uh, Dr. Macy talks often about the importance of drinking lots of water, but also avoiding lots and lots of caffeine. I know I can hear they're like, oh, cringing when I say that, um, but also avoiding lots and lots of adult beverages. Um, it's important that we really take good care of ourselves, make sure that we're eating well and often enough. A lot of people when they're really stressed, some people eat too much, other people don't eat enough. If your body feels terrible, your, your, your heart and your soul are going to feel terrible too. Um, and you know, the last one here, number 10, I, this is my favorite one. We spend an awful lot of time picking out the things that we're not good enough at. I, for one, I'm not proud to admit it, I'm not a super organized person. I have to work on it every single day. Many of us spend a lot of time focusing on what we're not good at and not enough time focusing on the things that we are really good at. And so number 10 is to recognize your signature strength, the thing that makes you uniquely you, the thing that you're really good at, um, and foster it and utilize it. Um, thank you so much, Greg, to the last slide, please. From all of us here at Mass Support, we wanna thank uh, Dr. Nicole Christian Brathwaite and Dr. Robert Macy for your time and your expertise and your little person who is now walking behind you. Oh, so perfect. Um, they did great. Um, I also want to thank uh, all of the Western Mass team who worked really hard, but the whole Mass support team who really helped with marketing tonight's event. Um, a special thank you to Anastina Wardlaw um, for hosting, but also the tremendous number of hours you put in behind the scenes to prepare for this. I also would like to give a shout out to Greg um, and Nick, who are the men behind the curtain who have helped us with all of our technical pieces. Um, please know that Mass Support is here for you, whether it feels little or it feels big. You can reach us at 888-215-4920 uh, or at our uh, email address and someone will get back to you. Um, before you leave us, September is Suicide Prevention Month and so Mass Support Network has decided that our September Town Hall will be on suicide prevention. If you could give us just one more moment of your time and fill out this poll and let us tell and tell us if there's any issues that are really important to you around suicide prevention and that you would want to attend another town hall on. And thank you so much for all of your time. Thank you. Have a great night, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.